Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on ecosystems. Now, before you watch this, make sure you've watched my previous video on photosynthesis um, so that you're confident and comfortable with that material. Now, in this video, we will be looking at ecosystems and getting some basic definitions in place. Then we'll look at food chains and webs, biotic factors, abiotic factors, parasitism and mutualism, and then the core practical. Now, we're going to start by getting some basic definitions in place. So the first definition is just this word organism. Now, an organism is an individual living thing. For example, a caterpillar. You rarely get one organism on its own. So instead, we talk about a population. A population is all of the members of a given species living in an area. So in this example, my population of caterpillars is four because there are four caterpillars. However, again, you never get just a single living thing existing on its own. You get many different species of living things. And we call that a community. So a community is all of the populations of different species living in an area. So in this, um, uh, in this community, we might have some birds. I think those are probably chaffinches. We might have some foxes and we might have some trees. And we've got populations of each of those different um, species and that that combines to form the whole community now all of those then combine together to form what we call an ecosystem so an ecosystem is the interaction between the living community and the physical environment in which they live um, and so we can see all those different organisms we we, we saw just now are still there there's our foxes there's our chaffinches there's our uh, caterpillars we've got our trees all of them combining together to form what we call an ecosystem. Now, in ecosystems include all of the living species in an area, but also, you know, the rocks, the soil, the hills, the rivers, the lakes, and, and all of that good stuff as well. Really importantly, ecosystems are self-sustaining. If you think about a woodland, no one needs to do anything to a woodland to keep it alive and to keep it healthy. In fact, it's better if we do nothing to it. They will just look after themselves. That's the self-sustaining nature of an ecosystem. A really important idea in all of biology is the idea of interdependence, which is the idea that all living organisms depend on other living organisms for their survival. And that includes us. You know, we simply couldn't survive without the uh, animals and plants that provide us with food and without the trillions of bacteria that live inside our digestive systems and help to digest that food. So we are dependent on other living things for our survival. Now, one way of showing this is with a food chain. So a food chain is an example of interdependence, and it is a diagram showing the flow of energy as one organism eats another. So for example, let's imagine we had an oak tree. The leaves of an oak tree are eaten by caterpillars. So energy flows from the oak tree to the caterpillar. The caterpillar might be eaten by a bird, like a great tit there. So its energy flows into the great tit. And then finally, the great tit might be eaten by a sparrow hawk. And again, the energy flows into it. So the food chain shows how the energy from an oak tree can end up in a sparrow hawk. Now, a bit more complicated than food chains, we've got food webs. These show all of the interconnected food chains in an ecosystem. So, for example, we might have a woodland ecosystem like you might see around us. Now, the producers in, an eco in, a, in a food web are the bottom level of it. These are the things that are producing the biomass um, and that's essentially just plants. So plants are producing biomass by photosynthesis. Biomass is just essentially living matter. Okay. Now, in this uh, ecosystem, in our, in our food, we've got, we've got grass and oak trees as the producers in that food web. They are the ultimate source of all of the rest of the food in the food web. Now, the next level in a food web, we've got primary consumers. These are our herbivores, our plant-eating animals. So in this case, the grass is being eaten by rabbits and slugs and insects. And the oak tree is also being eaten by the insects as well. So those are our herbivores, our primary consumers. Now, you well know that rabbits and slugs and insects will be eaten by other animals. And we call those other animals secondary consumers. Now, secondary consumers are carnivores or predators because they get their food by eating other animals. They eat those primary consumers. So, for example, we've got frogs eating slugs 
we've got voles eating insects, and we've got great tits eating the slugs and insects as well. Now, those carnivores, those secondary consumers, can also themselves be eaten, and we call the animals that eat them, they are called tertiary consumers. So these are carnivores that eat other carnivores. They eat the secondary consumers. Um, so for example, our hawk is eating the great tits, the voles and the frogs. Our fox is eating the frogs and the voles and also the rabbits. And there's just a little point worth making here is that whether we call the fox a secondary or tertiary consumer slightly depends on which food chain we're looking at. Because if we look at this food chain, grass, slug, frog, then the fox would be a tertiary consumer. But if we look at this one, grass, rabbit, fox, then the fox would be a secondary consumer. So the language is slightly flexible, but I think you get the general idea. So biotic factors, what is this about? This is about, um, biotic factors are living factors that affect the community in an ecosystem. Essentially, these are the living influences on what can live, where, and how well it can live. Now, one major biotic factor is competition. This is the idea of individual organisms struggling constantly to get the resources that they need for survival. And there are lots of different resources they might be competing for. They might be competing for food, both with other members of their own species and with members of different species. You know, imagine a lion trying to compete to get enough gazelles to eat. Well, other lions might eat those gazelles, but also leopards and cheetahs might as well. So they're competing with other organisms to get enough food. They're competing for shelter. They're competing for territory, actually somewhere to live. And they may be competing for breeding partners as well, so that, so that they can pass on their genes. So competition is one major, major um, biotic factor. Another one is the idea of predation. As well as competing for food, animals want to make sure they don't become food. They want to avoid predation. And that leads to the idea of what we call predator prey cycles. So these show how the numbers of predators and prey in an area depend on each other. So if we look, say, at the numbers of rabbits and lynx in an area, now rabbits uh, are, get eaten by lynx, and we see their numbers cycle like this. So we can see as the number of rabbits goes up, it reaches a high, and that means when the number of rabbits is high, there's more food for the lynx to eat, so their numbers go up. Okay? As the number of lynx increases, they start to overeat the rabbits, so the number of rabbits goes down. With less food available, fewer of the lynx survive and their numbers start to decrease as well. Once the lynx numbers have gone down, the reduced predation means the number of rabbits can increase uh, because more of them survive and so their population starts to peak again. Now that there are lots more rabbits to eat, the number of lynx starts to go up again and you can see we just go back round the cycle. And we often see these predator-prey cycles, particularly in ecosystems where the um, the predators only have a few different prey species to rely on. In addition to biotic factors, we also have abiotic factors. Now, an abiotic factor is a non-living factor that can affect the community in an ecosystem. Now, examples of this are things like the temperature, the light intensity, um, you know, how much water there is, um, and the presence of pollution as well. All organisms are adapted for the abiotic factors in the habitats where they live. So if we think about a camel, a camel um, uh, is adapted to live in very hot, dry desert environments, and so it is able to withstand the very high temperature of the desert. It's able to go long periods of time um, without needing to drink water, and so on, because those are the abiotic factors in its ecosystem. Equally, something like a polar bear is adapted to live um, in um, very cold temperatures, um, so it's got you know thick fur and a thick fat layer to help insulate it. It's adapted to be able to camouflage against the snow that is common where it lives and so on. Now, importantly, very few organisms are able to or are adapted to tolerate pollution. So the presence of pollution generally harms nearly all of the organisms living in an ecosystem. And the other thing is that um, when human activities, uh, so when these factors are changed by human activity, for example, climate change, the organisms may no longer be well adapted for where they live 
and they can die. So we know, for example, that polar bears are adapted to live on ice and to hunt on ice. And as global warming um, causes less and less and later and later development of ice in the Arctic, the polar bears are finding themselves less and less well adapted for survival there, and their numbers are starting to fall. Let's look now at parasitism and mutualism. These are two different types of relationship between uh, different species of living organisms. Now, parasitism is when one organism, which we call the parasite, feeds off another organism, which we call the host, with no benefit to the host. But importantly, the parasites don't generally kill the host. They keep it alive, but they feed off it. So examples of this might be fleas. Your cats and dogs at home may well have had fleas if they've been, un been uh, unlucky. Um, they suck the blood of cats and dogs and provide no benefit to the cat and dog, but they don't kill it either. You might have um, come across tapeworms. These are uh, worms that live inside your intestines and absorb nutrients, but again, they provide you no benefit, but they also don't kill you. And particularly in the winter, you might see clumps of mistletoe in the trees. So once the trees have lost their leaves, Sometimes you still see these kind of ball-shaped structures inside the trees. That's actually mistletoe, which is a parasite that puts its roots into the tree branches and absorbs their nutrients. Another kind of relationship is called mutualism. This is a relationship where both organisms benefit. Good examples of this, um, you might have come across oxpeckers. Now, oxpeckers are birds that they will eat the parasites from the fur of mammals which gives them a meal and it cleans the mammal. So you know, that bird there, the, the um, gazelle is more than happy to let that bird stay there because the bird is doing it a favour by getting rid of parasites like you know ticks and fleas and the bird gets a meal for doing that. A um, super important example of mutualism is your gut bacteria. Your guts contain trillions of bacteria and those bacteria get shelter and food in your gut and also they help you digest your food more effectively so that you can get more nutrients from it. They even help to improve your mental health as well. Now we had a core practical in, the, uh, in this unit which was split into two parts. The first part is what we call random sampling. Now the aim of this core practical was to estimate the number of daisies or some other plant that was on a field. And to do this, it works something like this. So your method is to first of all measure the area of the field, measure the height and width and multiply them to get the area. In this case, we've got a very small field, just 2.5 metres by 2 metres. Then what we did was we got a quadrat and we dropped it at random on the field and counted the number of daisies in the quadrat. So you can see that there. So in this quadrat, I've got one, two, three, four daisies. Now remember, a quadrat is just like a sort of a metal square that is normally 0.5 metres by 0.5 metres square. Um, and we just use them to define like a, a certain area where we're just going to count the number of daisies in that one area. Then what we do is we repeated it a further nine times. So we just drop the quadrat somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else and so on. And each time we counted the number of daisies. Now, important you've got to try and do this randomly you're, you're not aiming to throw the quadrat at some daisies you're just dropping it and counting the number of daisies that happen to end up in the quadrat um, then what we did was we calculated the mean or the average number of daisies in each quadrat um, and then we have to scale the number of daisies in one quadrat we have to scale that up to the whole field and we'll look on the next slide at actually how to do that uh, in practice so so our results from our um, random sampling might look something like this. So you know, in quadrat one, we got four daisies. Quadrat two, we also got four. Quadrat three, we got three and so on. Now, in, all, in terms of analysis, the first thing to do is to determine the mean number of daisies. So we're going to add up all of the number, all of the daisies and divide it by 10 because we've got 10 measurements. And that gives us an answer of 3.4 daisies per quadrat on average when you're putting this in the calculator, be careful about bid mass. Don't just go, you know, 4 add 4 add 3 add 2 add 4 add 5 add 3 add 3 add 2 add 4 divided by 10. Because if you do that, it will just divide the 4 by 10 and not everything else. So do it in brackets or hit equals first.
Once we've done that, we have to determine the area of the quadrat. Now, the quadrat was a metal square like this, and its width was 0.5 metres, and its height is 0.5 metres as well. So to determine the area, we do 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 to give an area of 0.25 metres squared. Next, we determine the area of the field. Now, if you remember from the previous slide, the field was 2.5 metres tall and 2 metres wide. So the area is just 2.5 multiplied by 2 to give me 5 metres squared. In the examples you choose, they will have much bigger fields, but um, I needed something that would fit on my slide uh, comfortably. Now, next what we do is we determine how many times the quadrat fits on the field. So if we know that the um, field has an area of 5 metres squared and the quadrat has an area of 0.25 metres squared, we can divide one by the other. So divide the area of the field by the area of the quadrat. So do 5 divided by 0.25, and that tells me that 20 quadrats fit on the field. So the last thing to do then is to multiply the mean number of daisies by the number of quadrats to find the total number of daisies, uh, or our estimate of the total number of daisies on the field. So in this case, we would do 3.4, which was our mean number of daisies per quadrat, multiplied by 20, which is the number of quadrats that fit on the field. And that gives me a final estimate of 68 daisies on the field. Now, it's worth noting that on that previous diagram on the previous page, the actual number of daisies is 70. And I've just calculated that it's 68. So that 68 isn't me saying this is how many daisies there are. It's me saying this is a reasonable estimate of the number of daisies there are. And this becomes it becomes much more clear why you should do this when you start to realize that you know a typical school playing field will literally have hundreds of thousands of daisies on it so there's no way you could practically count them all so just doing something like this to get a reasonable estimate is a perfectly valid thing to do the aim of the second part of the core collapse school was to do what we call a belt transect now the aim of a belt transect is to um, see how the distribution of a uh, species varies with some particular abiotic factor. So we're investigating how an abiotic factor affects the distribution of daisies or some other organism. Now to do this, we took a quadrat and we placed it touching the trunk of a tree. You can see that first quadrat is there touching the tree trunk. Then what we did was we counted the number of daisies in a table uh, so, uh, uh, and recorded it in a table. We also measured and recorded an abiotic factor using suitable equipment. Now, it doesn't matter which factor you use. Maybe you measure the pH with a pH meter or the light intensity with a light meter or the soil humidity with a moisture probe or whatever it might be. But you measure some kind of abiotic factor. Then you move the quadrat one meter away from the trunk and you repeat all of your measurements. Okay, And you keep on doing that until the quadrat is 10 meters from the tree trunk. Each time, move the quadrat one meter, count the daisies, measure the abiotic factor, rinse and repeat until, we've, until we're 10 meters from the tree. Now, your results of this experiment might look something like this. So you can see we've got the distance from the tree in meters, we've got the number of daisies in each quadrat, and we've got the light intensity measured in units of lux. Now, um, from these results, what you can see is that as the distance from the tree increases, the number of daisies increases, but you can see that it levels out. It, it kind of goes up steeply to start with, and then around here, it really stops increasing, and we hit a fairly kind of constant number of daisies. And equally, the light intensity does the same thing. It rises up steeply to begin with, but again, by around here, you can see it's pretty much leveled out, and it stops increasing because we're a certain distance from the tree where we're no longer affected by its shade. So in terms of conclusions, we might say that increasing the distance from the tree increases the number of daisies and the light intensity and then we could give a reason why the number of daisies goes up we could say increased light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis enabling more daisies to grow and we could also point out that the light intensity levels off at greater distances from the tree so the number of daisies stops increasing that's what these results might show now importantly the exact results are unimportant and they will vary because there are lots of different ways to do this. But you need to be able to describe the trend 
in the results um, and you need to be able to offer an explanation for the results. So you've just got to look carefully at the data table or the graph or whatever the results you're presented with in the exam and come up with something reasonable like we've discussed here. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.